Today's video is going to be a comparison of the standard Mitsubishi P73 red laser diode to the new Claro uh, 700 milliwatt diode that just recently came out and is a potential competitor for uh, laser display applications. What I've done is I've taken one of my newer projectors that uh, has some optics that have been manipulated to maximize the performance of the P73, and I'll go through what I've done that might be useful for other people. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap out at the very end uh, the new diode and run it essentially through the same optical train, the same power setting, to see whether or not it is in fact superior, inferior, or just pretty much the same as the Mitsubishi. It's already been demonstrated that the Mitsubishi and the Oclero are fairly similar in terms of their overall power when overdriven. At about 1.4 amps, they both pop out at about 1.1 watts, even though the Mitsubishi is a 500 milliwatt rated uh, diode and the Oclero is a 700 milliwatt rated diode. That's probably just the way that the spec sheets have been put together. What I'm going to be looking at is not power, but just uh, sh image sharpness and uh, the divergence of the diode when put through an optical frame. If you look over here, you'll see a projector that I have done a recent video on. I've gone through the layout. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through the red train in a little bit more detail and explain what I've done to manipulate the optics and improve the output. I've got this small piece of paper over here simply because I'm only allowing one of the diode's outputs out. And as a consequence, the reflection from the uh, blocked diode is so much of a uh, red um, wash in here, I don't want it to hurt the camera, I don't want to make it difficult to image. So I've just put this over here temporarily so that we can image the uh, optical train a little bit better. The P73 is being driven at, right now at this point, at 600 milliamps, which is just a little bit over a half power setting for a 1,200 uh, milliamp drive at 5 volts. So I've got this just about uh, 600 milliamps at this point. So it's about half power. The uh, optical train is as follows. The output from the P73 goes through a collimator, which is a 4 millimeter aspheric optima lens placed in a 9 millimeter barrel holder, a standard barrel holder that these uh, diode mounts uh, can be mounted into. Uh, sometimes you'll use the professionally made mounts. Uh, these are made by um, laser show parts. They're brass. I made these custom out of aluminum simply because I wanted to mount them in a box where this, uh, the height of these diode holders wouldn't uh, be compatible with the optical train. So these are aluminum. Uh, they're very similar in design and dimension, so there's nothing remarkable about them. They pass the beam about 100 millimeters through some optics to the first cylindrical lens that's going to be used to expand the beam. As it passes to this point, it passes through a 4 millimeter V-coated or a narrow band uh, anti-reflection coated window. That's because of this hermetically sealed box so that I can lower the temperature of these diodes. They're on a three uh, stage Peltier device that lets me get down to about minus 30 degrees. But at this point I'm just running at room temperature. I'm not doing anything fancy, but I bring up the fact that there's this par plain parallel window in here which probably is affecting the spherical aberration that I'm correcting later on. In addition, it passes through a contacted, not air spaced, wave plate that's located in front of only one of the diodes. That's to allow the diode's polarization to be rotated so that when it passes through the 15 millimeter uh, JML uh, PBS cube, uh, that particular polarization will pass straight through the interface and to the cylindrical lens. The cylindrical lens is, a, is an Edmund 25 by 50 millimeter, minus 25 millimeter focal length with its curved surface pointed away from the diode. 50 millimeters later, there is a, an Edmund circular 25 millimeter diameter minus, uh, excuse me, plus 100 millimeter focal length uh, cylindrical lens in a holder that lets me rotate the lens about the axis that the uh, light is passing through in order to match its orientation of vertical to this orientation of vertical and make up for any kind of machining errors in the operation or in the uh, construction of the lenses. You'll notice also, if you look very carefully, 
that this holder has a small curve here. It's because I had to machine this to allow this particular lens to be mounted in such a way that its curved surface points again toward the diodes. In other words, the curved surfaces on both of these cylindrical lenses point toward each other. This is not the standard uh, operating procedure for most telescopes in order to try to minimize uh, induced uh, spherical aberration. You normally would mount the curved surface toward the more parallel light and the flat or long radius surface to the more uh, convergent or divergent light. But in this case, I'm actually trying to add spherical aberration because it's my theory, and I think I've been proven right, that the flat optics in this diverging beam that's coming out of the, out of the collimator uh, create or introduce some spherical aberration which this improperly mounted pair counteracts. As a consequence, I remove much more of the spherical aberration going through this uh, beam expander than I did when this was turned around 180 degrees flipped and the curved surface was this way, and this was turned around 180 degrees and the curved surface was this way. That was the big uh, revelation that I had about a week ago when I had come up with this new uh, design, and it's different than when I had originally demonstrated this projector a few weeks ago. The beam then travels, uh, in this case, hopefully quite close to parallel, uh, to a bounce mirror that then passes it through a 75 millimeter and a 75 millimeter lens pair. As a result, no magnification or demagnification occurs, but there is a focus here at my uh, spatial filter, which in this case has been pulled way far apart so that there's no spatial filtering going on at all. We're not going to get into that at this point. I'm just going to show that the beam passes through two more lenses, which I determined that light convention are best mounted with their curved surfaces toward the most parallel beam and the flat surfaces inbound toward the focus, the mutual focus of these two lenses. The final beam then bounces off of this dichroic filter from laser wave, passes through this dichroic filter from laser wave, and then would normally hit a scanner mirror on its way out of the, t of the projector. I've stopped it here on one of the most matte black surfaces I have in order to take a measurement of the beam at this point. Now hopefully it's not washing out too much. I'm gonna hold this meter below here. And the meter, if you look carefully, is 1 8 inch per line or approximately 3 millimeters per line. And you can see that the bright part, because this again is not spatially filtered, is a hair under 2 eighths, 1 quarter or a little under 6 millimeters. I'd put it at about 5.5. And this is right at the position of the scanner. The light then, if I take this block away and allow it to continue on, will travel across the room and hit that front surface bounce mirror over there approximately 11 feet away. It then bounces all the way across the room to that very low quality second surface uh, household mirror and then reflects off of that household mirror to a screen and the total distance is about 15.7 meters when you travel the entire distance back and forth. If you look here, I don't know if the spot is washing out uh, the lines around it, but these lines are each 2.5 millimeters wide. And to my count, uh, the, the bright part of the spot, which is the spot, which is the point that goes from right there to right there, is just a hair over four squares, or 10 millimeters. What I'm going to do in order to sort of image that a little bit more easily in the camera is I'm simply going to take a front surface mirror that has about a 99% reflectivity. Not a very good quality glass. It's probably not much better than float. And I'm going to place it in the beam. I don't think you want to image this, but just show that, in fact, I'm putting it here. And blocking about 99% of the light. Now maybe you can get a better image without the blooming and the washout of the width of the beam and the dimensions of the beam. I put it at about 4 millimeters by about 11 millimeters across. You can do the calculations on divergence, but I don't think it's really necessary. Uh, as long as you know that it'll fit your scanner, this is what you would have at that distance. Um, if you do want to do divergence, it's probably on the order of about a third of a milliradian in the worst axis. Now that demonstrates what I've done with the P73. And uh, as you can see, when I take this away, I'm going to take the reflector mirror away. There's a lot of noise from this uh, diode. Clearly a lot of scattered light that comes from the multi-mode character of the beam, as you can see in stripes. There's a little bit of light pier 
peeling off to the side. And it's one of the reasons why I like to use spatial filters so much, especially with these lenses, uh, especially with these diodes. I've come to like the spatial filtering so much that you can see in this projector, I also use it in the blue. And when the green laser eventually is replaced with some diodes, I will also use spatial filtering for that purpose. Just to show you what happens to that spot that you see on the wall, I'm gonna take my fingers here and I'm gonna bring this bottom razor blade up so that you can see basically what happens as you begin to move the, the, beam, the uh, razor blade up, what happens to the scattered light that is shown on the screen. Now, if I spend about a minute here doing this just right, I can make this spot really nice. If you want to take a break on the camera for a sec, I'll waste my own time and not yours in order to just fine tune the positioning of this. Welcome back. I made the adjustments to the spatial filter and as you can see, the spot looks a heck of a lot nicer now that I've done the filtering. In addition, if you look carefully at the grid pattern, you can see that I didn't actually cut off any of the bright light. I mean, it's still the same width, but I've not allowed any of the other light to pass through it. And with that size spot, matching well with the blue and the green, you get a very nice white beam without any halos and without any smear or junk surrounding the final point. So that's why I like spatial filtering, but that's not the point of this video. So when I show you the Eau Claro, I'm going to show you it also without the spatial filter in place, and we'll see if it compares favorably with this Mitsubishi. Welcome back. It's been about 35 minutes. I've spent about 10 minutes doing some soldering and 20 minutes doing some aligning, and as you can see, I've taken the box, the hermetic box, off of the two diode support structure, and you can see that there are two diodes mounted here. One, the old Mitsubishi P73 is still there. I haven't changed it, I haven't touched anything about its optics. Here is the Eau Claro. I had to refocus slightly, bringing the uh, lens in a little bit because it appears that it has a slightly uh, farther, uh, a shorter uh, height for the uh, emitter from the flange plate of the uh, diode. So therefore I had to move the lens in a little bit. But maximizing the alignment of the diodes through here after focusing, and then going through the entire same optical train, uh, putting the two diodes slightly in misalignment, one slightly above the other, just so that you can see them at the distance. They still travel the full, uh, about 15.7 meters from the projector across the room, back to the old reflector mirror, and then to the same projection screen. The Mitsubishi is, sadly to report, the one on the bottom. I'm going to block it right now. And the one on the top is the Eau Claro. You can see that the Eau Claro does have a little bit less um, scatter. I'm going to now show you just the Mitsubishi. But the Mitsubishi just seems to uh, jump into a sharper focus. And it's not as if I haven't tried to focus. I've actually maximized both the um, collimator as well as the individual lenses to try to just maximize this uh, output as much as possible. This is as good as I can get it. And I'm a little disappointed. It's not even as good as the P73. And I had hoped that it was gonna be as good as the smaller, lower powered 300 milliwatt G71. So I don't think the Eau Claro's are gonna do it for me. We're gonna to have to wait to see if uh, new diodes come out in the future. But uh, as soon as this video is over, I'm gonna put the Mitsubishi back again. And uh, I think that's all she wrote for the Eau Claro. So I thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and until next time.